Hi everyone, uh, welcome to ELI, the place where you get your daily dose of inspiration for entrepreneurship. And today we have with us Mr. Pinaki Gupta, who is the founder and director of uh, uh, Pizarto Online Art Gallery, an online art gallery offering uh, hand, painted, uh, hand painted art curated from artists across the world. Pinagi is a graduate of Xavier Institute of Management Bhubaneswar and has worked for more than 22 years with companies such as uh, Tata Interactive Systems and Nagarjuna Fertilizers uh, before starting his own venture. Uh, hi Pinagi, uh, welcome to ELI. Hi Priya, thanks. Uh, Pinagi would uh, request you to introduce yourself to our audience please. Okay, so you did the introduction, so I don't think there is anything much left. So uh, as you uh, encapsulated everything, so it's been almost 22 years of corporate journey, which I had done. And then uh, it was at the end of the financial year last year, I decided to hang up my corporate boots and uh, get onto a journey of entrepreneurship and started Pesato Online Art Gallery. So that's how it has been. So it's been a little over a year kind of a stuff that we have been in existence. Okay. Uh, Pinaki, tell us about the Pizarto. What is it about in a very detailed way? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Pizarto is completely a tech enabled online art gallery. It's a pure play online gallery. So it's not an omni channel, unlike most of the art galleries, which are there where they have physical presence. So we are trying to change the buying behavior of customers because this is one of the industries where technology has not gone deeper. A, B is people still don't feel very comfortable buying something in the online space. So we are giving them uh, paintings and artworks with trust and assurance of quality. So that's there. But uh, we started this company to fulfill two purposes, prime purposes. The first one was, of course, to bring global art to the doorstep of art lovers. People don't need to travel throughout the world to get art today. So we are getting it for them because um, uh, what has happened is in India, people have started traveling quite extensively because of IT industry, affluence, holidays and kind of stuff. And people have started appreciating art globally which was not the case earlier. Earlier it was used to be more the temples and the caves which used to people see and say that this is artwork kind of a stuff. So that is there. And the second thing is, it's a bit of a social impact kind of a thing which we are trying to do is offering a platform to emerging and talented artists, a platform so that they can come and showcase their stuff as well as reach out to a wider audience. So currently, if you look at the artist and the artworks which get sold, they are very, very localized, right? If someone is in Bhubaneswar, generally around Bhubaneswar, only buyers are there. The same thing happens with a Bangalore or a Delhi or something like that, because they are all in the physical galleries. And people who come and visit the physical galleries are the ones who are more localized in that space. Not like a Bombay guy will not go and attend a Delhi art uh, festival or something like that and buy something. So this basically what is happening is uh, they are getting a platform whereby uh, pan India buyers are there and we are getting a lot of traction from tier two, tier three cities where never an art festival happens or there aren't any art galleries. Hmm. Uh, Pinaki, tell us a uh, uh, few of the things that uh, people may, do not know about the industry in general, the art industry. So uh, here are a few questions. Can the art industry be uh, uh, internetized or uh, brought to the online space fully? What is your view on that? Uh, see, I would say that if you look at the art industry and its evolution, uh, technology has not gone very deep in the art industry. This is one industry where technology has completely not penetrated if you look at it. So, so thereby you have segments in the art industry like uh, the early entrants or the first time buyers used to either buy uh, the prints which are there or the ones which are copies. So you will have the same Buddha being sold by one of these uh, e-homes kind of a shop which is there. And uh, if you are someone who understands a bit of art, 
you wouldn't want the same art to be in your neighbor's house and your house, right? Mm -hmm. So you want something unique. So if you look at our art, everything is unique. We don't have multiples of anything because people generally, if they're investing in art, they want that art to be unique. That's A. Mm -hmm. The B thing is that, uh, the B thing is that if you look at it, the other segment of art, which was the other extreme, is the auction segment, right? Where there is a bit of a technology involvement, which is there. But the thing is, there's a huge amount of certification process and certifying bodies like be the Christie's or the Saffron Art or any of those guys. So basically what happens is, you know that this is a Hussain's work, this is a Raja's work, or this is someone else's work and thereby someone is certifying the authenticity of it. So mm -hmm. you're comfortable and it is more like an investor class kind of a thing. It's not like you want to put it on the wall, appreciate art, they look at it daily kind of a stuff. So, so, uh, so this is a segment, the middle segment is the one which was completely void. A, uh, B is technology was not there. And if you ask me uh, whether technology can penetrate uh, into this segment, I would say yes. Uh, uh, one needs to have uh, good uh, players like us, I wouldn't say that we are still reached there, but players like us who can bring confidence to the buying segment. Uh, if you go back to maybe uh, the fashion industry 10 years back, uh, very few of us wanted to buy any clothing online because we felt that we want to touch the fabric, we want to do a trial and all those kind of things. But slowly today we all buy it online. Uh, we know what our size uh, is and all that kind of stuff. And with time, the confidence has come in, right? The same thing will apply with the artworks and the art industry. Like we have shipped and I would be touch wood, I would say that uh, not a single art piece has come back to us because of any reasons, because we don't do Photoshopping. We don't do any lighting for the paintings or anything like that. It's in the natural environment. The photos are taken and put. So that's one. And a small piece of technology, which we have tried to make a difference with is that uh, there is something called art on the wall feature. If you look at in our website, so it is basically a virtual kind of a thing. So what happens is, any of the paintings which are there, you can uh, see by putting it on the wall of different canned images. There are a bedroom, there's a living room and a dining space that is there, three of them. And the fourth feature is basically you can take a photograph of your room or the wall on which you want to put a painting and you can upload it on the website and the painting will be on one of the walls. You can drag it, enlarge it, see the way you want to see it so that it gives you a virtual feeling with the upholstery and the wall color, how the painting will look like. So no one in the industry has done this and we are the first one who has done it. So we are trying to make the virtual world a reality for people now. So as more and more technology goes in, I think people will start looking at it more carefully. Okay. So as you mentioned, uh, there are three categories in the art industry. One is uh, the investor class art uh, the, that is uh, dealt by two or three companies, uh, Christie's and Sotheby's. Uh, then there is the middle class. Uh, I think uh, many of the on online players are there. They are certifying the art, uh, certifying the authenticity of the art and uh, then uh, selling it uh, to the uh, consumers. And then there is the third category that is the uh, unorganized market. So, uh, so uh, the way I see it, uh, the top two categories are uh, in in that category there are artists who are uh, uh, well established they have good connections and there are they have a good uh, pipeline of uh, uh, the revenue coming in so uh, they they they're settled for uh, you know in a way they're stable uh, um, in terms of uh, the revenue and uh, income but when you when we talk about the uh, lower uh, uh, category, the artists uh, who are not getting enough revenue for their work. In fact, if you if you go to a, a mela or uh, you know uh, some uh, uh, fair uh, where the arts are being sold for hundred bucks, uh, twenty bucks, thirty bucks. So uh, when I go, when you go there and see the art pieces, you you will see that the not enough justice is being made to those artists, and they are not getting paid for the their work so can you can you share your thought what can be done to you know organize this industry and you know how the small scale artist can be uplift, uplifted yeah so uh, 
coming back to, I, I have a bit of a difference in opinion from what you said uh, in terms of the three segments. Uh, uh, I would say uh, the investor class segment, of course, uh, is the uh, segment where there is maybe enough money and cash flow happening. But unfortunately, if you look at it, uh, uh, the artist, most of the artists are dead. Uh, so their paintings are being traded. So not that they are benefiting out of any painting, right? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, it's like Van Gogh sold only one painting in his lifetime, right? Only all all his paintings were sold after he died. So so Van Gogh never got to see all the success that is there. So so the investor class also it's more like an investor who are trading and making money kind of a thing. So so that is one. Uh, in terms of the second one, which you said is very established and organized. No, it's not established and organized, unfortunately. And that's the reason if you look at it, uh, people, most of the painters are actually family driven, if you look at it, because they pass on the skills from one, one generation to other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can give you a very good story because uh, we, we have art from uh, different countries okay india being one of them of course the main country but we have uh, artworks from indonesia thailand and philippines uh, so we actually approach the painters and directly work with the painters uh, they are in mostly creative villages in which they are uh, staying and uh, it's the skill which has been passed over the generations kind of a stuff so in india also the same thing happens and uh, but unfortunately most of these people are uh, at the hands and mercy of middlemen. Uh, so, so they basically uh, are their agents uh, and uh, industry has mushroomed around them. So they are actually exploiting all of these folks, as you rightly said, maybe the 10 rupee art, 500 rupee art and 1000 rupee art, which are quite good. Uh, some of these people actually sell an enormous amount of money and pay only 1000 bucks to these painters. Mm. So, what we are, so what we are doing is like in our platform, uh, if you look at any of the galleries, for example, uh, gallery has become a big business today uh, because uh, no art uh, connoisseur or a collector or uh, a curator ever puts in his or her money to book the hall, right? They take money from the painters and artists and then book a hall and bring everyone together. Mm -hmm. In our case, we say that we will not take a single pie to list your paintings. So it's a zero cost at which a painter lists his money, uh, his artwork. Mm. Uh, the reason for that is we know that uh, they are in dire need of money. They have the skill, but unfortunately they can't reach and people are exploiting them kind of stuff. Mm. So we at our own cost, uh, put them on our platform by doing a lot of work, which goes in, uh, including uh, all the taxonomy, everything to be done by us because most of them can't do it and mm. then put it up there. So uh, our, our so what we are doing is uh, slowly we are encouraging a lot of these artists coming from smaller places uh, who were subjected or being at the mercy of these middlemen to come on our platform. So a lot of the painters who have come on our platform are from very small places. Uh, if you ask me, uh, is it possible to organize all of this? I would say it's a Herculean task because India is very vast, A, and B is if someone wants to do something like that, uh, uh, you will need a big distribution channel to be set up because mm. it's not about just listing the paintings from people in the villages, but also ensuring the fulfillment of the paintings, right? So once a sale happens, sometimes you can't even reach out to a painter because there's no network connectivity. And how do you get the painting to be uh, delivered to the customer? So those th challenges are there. But uh, I would say that we have made a beginning and we hope that there will be more players in this space uh, who come up like us uh, with an objective to actually uh, not make money money, if I say that way, but ensure that a wider reach is available for these painters. Uh, a lot of these painters, uh, like you said, also sell, uh, which are part of the unorganized sector. Uh, so that becomes very difficult to manage and also to know what is the real size of the market per se. Uh, so a few uh, Fiki and KPMG had tried to do a study and I don't think they could do it fully because the organized sector is so limited as compared to the unorganized sector. Uh, Pinaki, here is another question uh, around it. Uh, so what I have seen is most of the uh, the top rated artists, uh, the, the best of the best have come from societies where uh, there was appreciation for art or uh, in, in, in a much deeper sense, I would say, where there was uh, 
the uh, consumption power uh, consumption um, power with the consumers who can afford to buy arts and appreciate it uh, for example most of the good most of the best artists are from europe because they have a good consumer market and people have the appetite to uh, purchase the art right uh, but india as a market uh, consumer um, the uh, buying power is less and uh, hence the artists do not get uh, get the same level of uh, uh, well being i would say so having said that uh, I, I, as as uh, the current pandemic is um, pandemic is going on uh, the covid 19 has reduced the consumption power or uh, purchasing power of the people in a way uh, how do you see it impact the art industry i think it is already impacting the art industry because it is considered Uh, uh, among the luxury products uh, how is it going to impact in uh, coming days what wh- how how do you see the art industry in future in foreseeable future okay uh, it's been a bit of a paradox if you ask me because if you follow uh, the art industry in the last couple of months uh, i'll give example of the investor class and then the segment in which i operate uh, in the investor class again uh, there has been significant amount of transactions which have happened and there have been paintings where people have got returns of 400% kind of a stuff so uh, so maybe just like gold is shooting up uh, maybe painting people are investing and so there is no dearth of investors in the in, in the investment category of the artworks Hmm. uh coming back to our segment if you look at it uh the first couple of months of the pandemic actually threw us a big surprise for us uh we actually in the last 4 months have done the maximum sales than what we had done in the previous 8 months so 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 it was a big a uh, bit of a surprise and paradox for us because we were unable to comprehend what was happening and why it was happening like that Uh, we realized what happened was that a lot of people are working from home and this is the first time people are getting to see their walls and understand how their house looks like okay so 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 a lot of them have bought paintings okay so that is one and the second thing which we understood and realized because we have done some survey and did some interviews with some of our customers to understand what is the driving force because we thought that as you rightly said paintings is more like a discretionary spend right it is not a necessity Uh, a lot of them said that uh, pinaki please uh, hear this that we are making calls from home in zoom and webex and all that stuff we like to have a good painting behind us when we are actually making those official calls uh, so make it cheerful and look nice so we said that okay so we now get it so these are the two things which are driving having said that i would also say that of course people have become conscious about the price point at which they are buying it's not that they are buying the very expensive ones i would say the things which are around 30000 and less that is the segment which is selling now it's not that people are buying exorbitant price paintings mm. so it's been a bit of a revelation as well as a boon from for us from a pandemic perspective from an economic perspective but of course uh, overall i would say pandemic is not good because initially as i said a few of our orders which we got in the first couple of months we were unable to fulfill those orders uh because the courier services were down and all that stuff was there and so we had to cancel the orders or defer the orders and a few of the customers said that they don't want tent later on kind of stuff okay. so that's how it has evolved uh, one thing i am very curious uh, since you uh, mentioned the pricing part of it i uh, would like to know how does a artist uh, puts a price tag to the art okay that's a very very difficult question and a difficult uh process of dealing let me say that uh, uh anyone who has dealt with artist or someone who is creative we should know that they are very very emotional mm-hmm. uh, they are they, they are emotional and maybe that's the reason they do good work so uh but uh, for them uh, commercial sense is not one of the things which are their strength points uh, so thereby what happens is a lot of these artists either come with uh, at desperation at a very low price they come with or uh they feel that uh, their artwork is like the investor class kind of a stuff so they put a very exorbitant price so both the segments which we see so what we do is uh, our pricing is very very transparent with the artist unlike a lot of other peers in the industry who beat down the price of the painters and then inflate it 
as a, a selling price and thereby pocket the huge margin which happens in our case uh, it's a very very transparent process we generally play around with a 25% margin and we tell the customers or the artist actually in our sellers agreement that whatever is your price we just mark it with 25% and of course the gst after that over that and so that is how it happens so we guide a lot of these painters to tell them okay uh, this is a price which we don't feel comfortable with it's either too low or too high uh, please relook at it this is the range at which you should be playing at uh, and give them some comparatives of paintings which are listed on our website of different other artists and i would say 9 out of 10 times the painters just understand and says okay we will go with the price you are saying it sounds more fair because end of the day the objective is to make sales at a fair price that is the way it is because uh, you don't want things to be listed on a uh, platform and no sales happening uh, so it doesn't help any one of us uh, on the other side you don't want the price point to be so low because sometimes what happens is when you put the price point so low customers feel are ye fake hai it's not the right thing uh, either something is wrong some defect hai something is there because people are not used to think positively right people always think negatively so thereby that happens so we have to put a fair price and uh, i would say it's it takes generally an hour hour and a half of a call and convincing to the artist when a fair price is achieved at and of course it's a very subjective one it's uh, as you rightly said it's very difficult to price but you have comparatives of other players and other artists kind of a thing hmm uh, uh pinaki i think uh, if we discuss this is a endless discussion so let let's uh, get back to our core discussion where we will discuss about your journey as an entrepreneur first okay. i would like to start with uh, when did you think of becoming an entrepreneur i think you were on a very uh, well paying uh, job uh, so what made you switch your career at a very later later stage also yeah see uh, this has been something which was there in my mind and the first seeds of entrepreneurship or in zone in which i can work in was planted in around 2011 and that is the time i actually i have done a bit of investment in art let me just set that background and that was the first time i bought a piece of art and uh, in fact i had to wait for 3 4 years before i could buy that for two reasons one is of course i the price was quite exorbitant a for those days a decade back salaries were not so high and you did not have so much disposable income a and b is you were not confident that uh, was that the right price to pay kind of a thing so these were two things and over the years i bought a lot of paintings traveled and all that stuff happened and i felt this was a zone i was passionate about and this was a zone no one was addressing and so i felt that if i ever turn an entrepreneur uh, this is a zone i will actually look at so 2011 the seeds uh, were planted and i would say uh, in 2015 16 was the time uh when i started realizing and uh, that i was feeling restless and stagnating in the job and no excitement happening kind of a stuff so then i said that okay uh, maybe give it a couple of more years and then start so as i said last year at the end of the financial year i hung up my boots and said that okay this is the time to take a plunge and started this it's not been easy to take that decision but once you take the decision you have to stick with it kind of a stuff okay uh, now i would like to know how did you arrange the funds to build this uh, platform okay uh, see we were very clear from day one that we did not want funding from external sources uh, because we wanted to shape the business and give it a direction the way we wanted it to be uh, not an external guy coming and saying play the valuation game which is what generally most of the investors want because mm. and they are right because they have to get their returns kind of a stuff so uh, so uh, as i said it was from 2016 17 kind of a stuff from where we uh, at least i started thinking very carefully that okay this is a zone i want to get into so i started keeping some money aside for it kind of a stuff continuously on a monthly basis so that saying that this is how the journey would be and this is the corpus fund or the seed capital with which i will start with so that is how the funding came in and uh, so there was an initial seed capital in the last one year plus we had to infuse a little bit more capital but after that uh, it's been running on its own uh, i of course don't take a salary or anything like that so that is there but most of the costs are taken care from the sales which we do so the operating uh, expenditure is taken care from that perspective okay 
do you have a co-founder working alongside you yeah i have a co-founder uh, who i would uh, who has uh, who i have known for close to two decades now kind of a stuff uh, and uh, we are best of friends also i would say from that perspective and uh, he knew my passion about this space kind of a stuff and uh, so we spoke about i spoke to him i said i'm going to take a plunge uh, he said that okay if you are really uh, genuinely interested and convinced about this uh, let's do it kind of a stuff he continues to of course work uh, that is there uh, so he's more like a sleeping partner but the backbone of the organization i would say from that perspective and uh, there is a core team member as well uh, who incidentally used to be one of my team members way back in 2007 8 uh, he worked with the tatas with me and uh, then he moved on and uh, went to different corporations and all that stuff and finally he started his own company called infigrigit and uh, he manages some of the big brands in the country from an seo perspective so uh, once i started i went up to him and uh, seeked his guidance and help in terms of the seo part of it because completely when you do digital seo has to be very strong space so uh, and then uh, i realized that there was a big alignment so uh, and thereby i offered him to come into the uh, core team and he was uh, gracious and nice enough to say that okay i'll join you so that is how he is coming so the three members of us are the core or the rock of the business i would say from that perspective and uh, pinaki what what is your vision where you want to take this venture okay uh, it's a very difficult question i would say and uh, see uh, there there is of course a growth which we want uh, and uh, i wouldn't say that in terms of the value we have put a target per se uh, what we are more targeting at is how many painters we can bring onto this platform that is the way we are looking at it rather than from the sales side of it uh, because as i said there is a bit of a social aspect which we are trying to target and address in this platform uh, so uh, i would say that our target in the first year was 100 painters from india uh, we are very close to that number uh, and i would say that something around 500 to 600 is what we will look at in the next 3 years to have on our platform and of course the sales uh, sales happens if you have the repertoire of paintings at the right price point i would say okay and uh, what are the challenges you faced uh, along the way while building this venture Oh, the, every day is a challenge, I would say, because uh, and most of them are unforeseen challenges. Like when you work with a very organized setup, you have different departments who take care of every needs of an organization. Uh, when you start something and you are uh, more the active, I'm the only full time person from that perspective. Apart from uh, the, when I look at the three members who are the core team members, I'm the only full time one. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there are too many balls which you need to balance. and ensure that not a single ball falls because you are, you are the hr head you are the finance head you are the account head you are the business sales head everything you are right so so i would say that that is something which is there and the other important aspect which i realized uh, as i went ahead is entrepreneurship is a very lonely journey it's not uh, like in a corporate setup you have 10 people with whom you have lunch you are cracking jokes go out for a drink and all those kind of things socially you are very active uh in an entrepreneurship generally it's a very lonely journey so uh, and one needs to be uh, cognizant of the fact that that would be for some time uh, which is there uh, it's uh, the romanticism of entrepreneurship as it looks from outside is not as it is i would say so so every day is a challenge i would say that uh, you have to evolve and develop a business model because again when you are starting your business model also keeps changing right so that is how it happens so you have to be uh, aware that uh, what you are doing uh, is the right thing and where you need to do course correction uh pinaki uh, speaking of uh, loneliness and you know you mentioned sometimes uh, you uh, may uh, lack inspiration uh would like to know uh, when that happens where from where you draw your inspiration from uh, do you have a role model 
Uh, no, I am not one of those who has role models and reads uh, a lot of autobiographies and biographies of famous people. No, uh, I, I have a, I would say I have been fortunate enough to have a good set of people around me, be it from my college days, friends, uh, a lot of them are from exam, uh, my family. Uh, so who are very, very supportive kind of a stuff. And if I feel that I'm low or need a bouncing ba uh, punching bag or a uh, bag to bounce my ideas, I reach out to these guys. And most of the times I think I feel okay at the end of the day when I speak to them and all that stuff. So one, so it's very important to have an ecosystem of people who are very positive and invested in you, I would say. That is very important. It's not about uh, you go and talk to someone and that person listens to you but doesn't give any thoughts or anything. He's not invested in your success. Uh, so when I say invested in your success, it can be friends who have no stake in that company. But the thing is, they are real, genuine well-wishers. So that is how one has to be. And uh, uh, fortunately, I have been blessed with an ecosystem around like that people. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we are almost up with the time and I have uh, only uh, two or three questions left. I uh, would request you to answer okay. them very briefly. Uh, okay. First is, uh, how do you compare entrepreneurship with a full-time job? As I said, uh, in uh, the dynamics of entrepreneurship is quite different as compared to a full-time job. In a full-time job, your roles are far more structured. Uh, you know who is responsible for doing what kind of a stuff. In an entrepreneurship, you don't have any boundaries, right? As I said, in the morning, you might wear a HR hat. In the next moment, you are a finance person and then you are a salesperson. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple roles to juggle with. That's the big difference, I would say. And uh, how do you suggest our audience to start their journey as entrepreneurs? Uh, the first thing I would say is that one needs to, uh, three things which I look for in a business or anyone who is wanting to start a business, I say that you need to have a vision. That's a very important thing. The second thing, you need to be passionate or have a passion for it. And when I say passion, uh, a passion with purpose, because passion can change, right? Uh, today you might like soccer, tomorrow you might like cricket, but the purpose keeps you more aligned to that. And the third one is innovation. So I would say passion, vision, and innovation. These are three things which one needs to have clarity about uh, before starting a business because that keeps you grounded, focused, and also keeps you going kind of a stuff. Uh, Pinaki, uh, we are almost up with the interview. Uh, sure. One last question. If there is any ma final message you want to give to uh, potential entrepreneurs. Uh, I would say that uh, one needs to know that entrepreneurship is more like a, a marathon. It's not like a hundred meter race. Uh, the second thing is that my advice, again, personal advice is don't go and chase for funding from day one. Don't do that. Uh, first, bring the business to a place where you feel satisfied and comfortable in terms of the business model and the direction in which the business is going and then look for funding to go grow or scale it up. From day one, if you start chasing money like that, I would say that you better continue in your corporate world because there's a place where you have safety and you have money. Okay, on that note, I would like to close this session. Uh, sure. It was a great pleasure to host you here at uh, ELI. I think our audience would have got lifetime lessons from this video. Thanks for your time, uh, Pinaki, and our best wishes for uh, Pizzato. Thanks, Priya. Pleasure talking to you. Uh, viewers, uh, you can connect with Pinaki on LinkedIn by searching for Pinaki Gupta. Also, do visit their website by typing pizarto.com. So, whom do you want to have here at ELI for next episode? Do let me know in comments below. We'll be back. Uh, stay tuned to ELI.